Market Institute and Texas Tech. Um, I want to begin by asking you, somebody in the crowd who's not one of my friends or someone who's read something that I've written, when I ask you what you think of when you think of anarchy, what comes to mind? Sir? Chaos. Chaos. Anybody else? Self-governance. Okay. Anybody else? No central institutions. No central institutions. Those are... Anybody else before I move on? Those three answers are actually perfect, a perfect segue to the, to the introduction of what I want to talk to you about. They all encompass different aspects of anarchy. Some of those aspects of anarchy are quite an important part of conventional wisdom, chaos and disorder. Another part of them is this, this absence of central institutions, which I'm going to refine a little bit, by which when we're talking about central, centralized institutions, let's, let's call it a state or a government in order to distinguish it from other sorts of institutions. For example, self-governing institutions, which my friend in the front here pointed to, which are going to be sort of the connection or the disjoint at the same time between these different sort of faces of anarchy and I want, that I want to introduce you to. So here's a, a dictionary definition of anarchy, anarchy, which comports very well with the conventional wisdom. I don't recall which dictionary I pulled this out of, but a situation of disorder or chaos arising from the absence of a state. I think that's the way that most people certainly think about anarchy, as the gentleman in the back suggested, the sort of first answer that was given. And um, I want to basically try over the course of, of our time together here to move you a little bit closer to the view suggested by the gentleman in the front, that perhaps anarchy is less about disorder and chaos and more about self-governance. And I want to see how far in particular I can push you along those lines. And that's why the title of my talk is, Could Anarchy Work Better Than You Think? I didn't do a straw poll, though it might have been fun to do so, handing out a questionnaire before we got going, asking you what your views are about anarchy. If I said to you, how would a stateless society fare, or a stateless situation fare, relative to one in which there was a central government to oversee things? I suspect that most of you would have probably answered that the society or the situation overseen by a central state would perform and fare very well, substantially in a superior way to that which we would expect under, under anarchy. That vision, or that view again, comports with the sort of conventional definition here. I think, however, to sort of get us going, that there is a basic problem with this view. So I want you to think about the following sorts of situations or many societies, if you want to think about them that way. Is your household, which as far as I know does not have a central government or a state running it, is it disorderly? My household was, I guess, a little bit disorderly. Occasionally somebody smeared toothpaste on the bathroom mirror and my brother and I would sometimes fight, I guess, against my parents' will. Nevertheless, we didn't burn the house down. We all seem to get along reasonably well, and I think that this is the experience of most households. Is your book club or whatever other sort of social organization you may be a part of, is it chaotic? How many of you are a member of a book club? Does anybody still read? No. Back in the day, there were these things called book clubs, and books had pages, and, and nevertheless, I would attend these things frequently as a, as a, as a young nerd, uh, having progressed now to an adult one. I can't remember any frenzy paper cut fights emerging or anyone getting the corner of a book stuck in their eye, despite the fact that there was no state organizing or overseeing the interactions of the people who were part of the book club. How about your church? Raise your hand if you go to church. I don't think I can recall, and again, I'm only speaking from my own personal experience here, but I don't think I can recall a situation where I saw two parishioners at my church get into a fist fight uh, or rampant theft running among the parishioners. That's probably your experience too, despite the absence of a state. How about the Amish? Have you all heard of the Amish, presumably? Anybody here or read any newspaper articles about crazy butter churn fencing or someone getting their head smashed in with a pail of milk? The Amish have deliberately chosen to live outside the bounds of the, in the United States anyway, the United States central government. It's an anarchic society. Nevertheless, there aren't these crazy 
butter churn or otherwise sorts of violence behavior or, or rampant theft among the Amish. How about this room? You guys seem like a pretty tame crew to me. I don't expect that anyone's going to try and pick my pocket after the talk. I assign a very low probability with the possible exception of Professor Powell that someone will try and shoot me with a crossbow. <laughs> Yet there is no state to organize our interactions in this room. I have a suspicion that I know what you're probably thinking. I'm cheating. In fact, a state oversees all of these things. I'm going to come to that in a moment, but I might be cheating in other ways as well. In all of those situations that I just described to you, we're dealing with a very small number of people. Your family, for instance, maybe has four, five, six, maybe 12 people, still only a handful. And they're all very socially similar, what we call socially homogenous. In fact, they all have the same genetic stock. When the groups of individuals involved are very small and the individuals who are members of them are very socially close, you might think that it's not such a big deal that people aren't stabbing each other and stealing from each other because in those sorts of situations, we all know, people tend to get along pretty well. The smallness of the population and the social closeness of the people involved tends to make things easier. Also, in each of the groups that I just referred to a moment ago, my previous slide, all of the individuals that I pointed to are well behaved. There are probably a large number of bad apples in your church. Hopefully there aren't a large number of bad apples here. Everybody seems to be a pretty much cooperative type of person who wants to get along, doesn't, isn't interested in being malevolent towards others, isn't vicious. That's sort of cheating as well. Furthermore, and perhaps most importantly, as I pointed to a moment ago, in the instance of all the different small groups or societies that I pointed to a moment ago, they exist, although you might think of these small groups as miniature anarchic societies, societies without states. They exist in larger societies that do have states. So perhaps the reason why I don't expect anybody to shoot me with a crossbow isn't because it isn't, isn't a result of the fact that we're achieving cooperation and peace amidst anarchy in this room, but because you expect that if you shoot me with a crossbow, the police will come rolling in here and take you away. That's true for all the groups that I refer to. Finally, even if you didn't think that I was cheating in any of those ways, by making the situation in which I was claiming that we seem to not be observing disorder and chaos, despite the presence of anarchy in these groups, even if you didn't think I was cheating in these ways, you might think, well, even if they were purely anarchic, even if they didn't exist, for example, in societies in which there wasn't some state outside of them, that surely they would all be better off if they did exist in such societies. In other words, even if we are willing to call those things anarchies and we're willing to say that they're functioning reasonably well, there is no reason to think that they wouldn't perform much better if instead they could benefit from the presence of a central government. This sort of, the first three in particular, this host of, of features that I've described for you just now, together create what I like to call the conditions for easy case anarchy. They are the conditions that, especially the first three, the fourth one is a little bit different, when satisfied, make it possible for people to cooperate, to avoid chaos and disorder, and for people to be socially productive, despite the absence of a central government. They make it easy for us to do so. What I want to talk to you about today is harder case and what I'm going to call hardest case anarchy. What happens if in various ways we deviate from the conditions that I just mentioned a moment ago that make it easier for groups of individuals to get along without a centralized state? Does it in fact result in social collapse or organizational collapse, chaos and disorder as the conventional wisdom suggests? Or is it in fact possible that anarchy can function well even when we deviate from those conditions? For instance, when we have large populations with heterogeneous individuals, people who aren't all the same. When we are in societies where individuals don't exist in some situation where they can rely on an external state outside of their smaller community and so on. In other words, is social order and cooperation under anarchy possible when the features of, any, of easy case anarchy are not present? It's the first question we're going to address. <laughs>
Then, as I mentioned a moment ago, I want to turn to what I call hardest case anarchy. Is it possible that welfare under anarchy could in fact be higher than it is under a central government? That's a pretty strong, at least the, the intimation behind the question that I'm posing is quite strong and in a sense very radical. I want to suggest to you and to give you a preview, which you've probably already anticipated, that in fact societies without governments can outperform, in terms of basic human welfare, societies with governments. And I'm not, in order to make this point, when we get to it, just going to give you some arguments. I'm going to do that too, but I'm actually going to show you some evidence that this is in fact true in the world in which we actually live. Okay. First, let's talk about what I call harder case anarchy. In order to talk about harder case anarchy, so deviating from those conditions of easiest case anarchy that I mentioned a moment ago, I want to use the case of 18th century Caribbean pirates. Ben, when introducing me, remarked earlier that I wrote a book called The Invisible Hook, The Hidden, Econom Hidden Economics of Pirates. And a big part of that book was devoted to the governance organizations that Caribbean pirates had. Everybody's familiar with who's seen Pirates of the Caribbean? Johnny Depp, he's great, right? Captain Jack Sparrow, who, by the way, was modeled off of, his character was modeled off an actual historical pirate named Jack Rackham. Um, just a bit of pirate trivia for you. So these are the watery robes that we remember nearly two centuries after they're gone. They consisted of men like Blackbeard, whose real name was Edward Teach. Anybody ever heard of Black Bart Roberts? Any pirate aficionados in the crowd? A little bit. The most successful pirate of the Golden Age. The Golden Age of Piracy, which again, as I mentioned, was in the early 18th century, was in fact relatively short-lived. It only lasted for about a decade, from about 1716 or so to about 1726. Jack Rackham was part of these pirates. All the pirates that have basically been fictionalized, the ones that we hear about, uh, they're, they're the pirates of this era. There's a couple important features of these pirates that, that we need to understand. The first is that pirates quite obviously were not well behaved. So there's an important deviation from easy case anarchy. Far from it. When you think of pirates, you think of raucous, rock'em, sock'em type guys who are constantly drunk. Some of that is not right, as I'm going to talk to you about in a moment, but some of it is. The part that's especially right is the fact that pirates necessarily were outlaws. They were criminals. They made a living by devoting themselves to violence and theft. They were most certainly not good apples. Pirates were also not a homogenous group. In the early 18th century, pirates sailed in on pirate ships for months at a time at sea, which created a, social, a series of social problems I'm going to talk to you about more in a moment. And these guys, they were typically, the average early 18th century pirate ship had about 80 crew members. And these crew members came from all over Europe. There were English pirates, there were French pirates, there were Spanish pirates, and so on. Within a single pirate crew, which you can think of as a kind of miniature floating society, since they, as I mentioned, lived, lived and worked together for, for extended periods of time at sea, oftentimes didn't even, weren't even able to communicate with each other directly. They didn't speak the same language. They had very different backgrounds when it came to the countries that they were from when it came to the language that they spoke, and so on. Pirate crews were also racially very diverse. A large percentage of many pirate crews consisted of black pirates, which we don't typically think about, and cer certainly isn't the portrayal that is depicted in popular pirate fiction. But many of these black pirates were runaway slaves, taken from the colonies, who preferred pirating to being slaves, and so joined up with pirate crews. So you have a racially diverse and a uh, a geographically diverse group, group, of, uh, group of pirates. They weren't socially homogenous. Perhaps most importantly, and as suggested a minute ago uh, in terms of what I was suggesting with pirates being criminals, pirates, unlike your book club or unlike your church or unlike us in this room, could not rely on the state for anything. They were outlaws. Governments branded them as such. They couldn't use state-created laws against theft, for instance, to ensure that they didn't steal from each other, or state-created rules against murder to make sure that they didn't murder one another, or state-created regulations to regulate, regulate their behavior in any way. They existed in truly anarchic communities. They had no appeal whatsoever to the state. 
So they are a hard case for anarchy. They consist of violent criminals who are bad apples, who are not all the same, and who are unable to appeal to the state in order to try and make a go of things. So what sorts of problems do these situations create for pirates? Well, the first, as I mentioned, in fact, is and for, first and foremost for pirates, was that they needed some way to prevent theft and violence among each other, some way to regulate basic social interaction. They were committed murderers and thieves, but if they permitted that criminality, those predilections for outlaw behaviors, to run rampant within their own communities, they would have not been able to, in fact, cooperate for piracy in the first place. It's sort of an interesting paradox for pirates. Piracy in the early 18th century was necessarily jointly produced. There was no such thing as a one-man pirate crew. It would have been difficult to undock as a single pirate, let alone to overwhelm an armed merchant ship, which were the prizes that pirates were after. In order to successfully engage in coordinated plunder, pirates needed to work together in large teams. As I mentioned, several dozen. Typically, the crews, as I mentioned, 80 plus. Some of them went up to several hundred members. They had to figure out then some way to get along to work together in order to make this enterprise possible. And they had to do that without the state. The second piece of this, which is closely related to the first, is that pirates needed some way to regulate externalities on their ships. Externalities are behaviors that individuals engage in that are not mediated by the price me mechanism, that have spillovers for other members. So Ben and I just came back from a trip in Las Vegas. And I was at a craps table there. I actually have two, if you'll permit me a sidebar. This is related to externalities, I promise. There, there were two, two features of this craps table that made me think of externalities. So on the one hand, there were two guys at the other end of the craps table that I was playing at who got in some kind of a scuffle. And they knocked over in this scuffle a whole bunch of the chips on the table. Their behavior created a negative externality for the rest of us. What we all had to do as a consequence was to sit there. The house had to go through everybody's chips and do the counting. It took like 15 or 20 minutes before we were able to resume play. That's an example of an, of an externality. Another example of an externality, which in fact in my mind should not be counted as an externality, is secondhand smoke. I say that as a smoker. At the tables in, in uh, Vegas, in fact, at the casinos in general, if you've been there, you know, you're allowed to smoke. In fact, you're allowed to smoke cigars. So I, I went up to one of these tables and I lit my cigar and a gentleman subsequently came along. Now, this is the sidebar that I wanted to get to. Note that we are in a casino in Las Vegas, which permits smoking and permits cigar smoking at the table I'm at. Okay, that's the background. Nevertheless, the gentleman who came along proceeded, as many anti-cigar folks do, I hope there are none in the crowd, to make a series of utterances of curses under his breath and eventually quite vocally in my direction as a result of the fact that I was smoking. For him, the smoke was creating a negative, external, a negative externality. It was spilling over onto him. Never mind the fact that he came to the nuisance. I was there first and I was allowed to smoke. <laughs> Put that aside. So what does this have to do with pirate ships? Well, I mentioned these pirate crews of 80 or more crew members. Early 18th century pirate ships were in fact seized merchant vessels, the average variety of which maybe was 200 or so tons. On a 200 or so ton merchant ship, they typically carried about 10 to maybe a dozen merchant crew sailors. So that gives you a, an idea of the number of crew members who were intended to be on these ships. Pirates packed the same vessels with 80 plus guys. So they were packed into, the, into their ships like sardines. Well, thinking back to my strange casino examples, perhaps, I gave you a moment to go, think about the types of negative spillovers in that sort of an environment that could emerge for members of a pirate crew. Smoking was, of course, one problem, although I highly doubt that any pirates were concerned with the imagined effects of secondhand smoke. Uh, but there were other problems related to smoking. So for instance, if a smoke or pi pirate lit his pipe in the hold of the ship, which is where the gunpowder gun powder was <laughs> held, for example, it could blow the entire crew to smithereens. Similarly, if there was some sort of a scuffle that emerged between two pirates on a pirate ship, similar to the scuffle that emerged at the casino, at the craps table that I was telling you about a moment ago, in that case, at the craps table, it ended up with some wasted time and some chips being shuffled around. But on a pirate ship, it could do far more damage 
These guys didn't scuffle by elbowing each other and knocking over casino chips. They scuffled with blunderbusses and cutlasses. When you've got 80 guys in a space designed for 12, it's very easy for an errant saber to slice somebody's arm off, or for a blunderbuss to kill another pirate. Equally important, remember that early 18th century merchant vessels, and thus pirate ships, were constructed of wood and cloth, more or less. It was possible as a consequence to puncture the ship, which was a critically important piece of capital for pirates to engage in the piratical exercise in the first place. So the various behaviors that any individual or couple of pirates on a ship might engage in could lead to these negative spillovers for the whole crew, which if pirates were to be able to cooperate in the first place, was somehow going to be needed to be regulated. Again, without a state. I also say up here, this is another chief piratical problem, was that pirates needed to somehow solve Madison's paradox. Does anybody know what Madison's paradox, who's read the Federalist Papers? Get your money back. <laughs> Write a letter. You should all read the Federalist Papers. There's funny documents that are the foundation for, uh, for the system of government that our country uses. And in them, James Madison, who was one of the authors of the Federalist, have you heard of James Madison? God bless you. So one of the paradoxes that, that Madison described was as follows. He said, look, we need to somehow endow rulers or leaders in, in groups or societies with some sort of power in part to overcome these problems that I just talked about. We need somebody, for instance, who could create and enforce rules against violence and theft. And we need maybe somebody who can create and enforce rules that regulate externalities. And for other purposes, we need leaders, just for, an or for organizational purposes. The problem Madison pointed out was that in creating leaders and endowing them with the authority to perform those tasks, we necessarily and simultaneously endow them with the power to abuse that authority, to use it for their own private purposes at society members' expense. Is that ringing any bells from like civics class or maybe something that you heard subsequently? That was, that was Madison's paradox. So how do you simultaneously empower and constrain rulers? Why do I say that pirates confronted this on their ships? Well, pirates needed leaders too. For instance, the primary income earning aspect of piracy necessarily in, 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 engaged in prospective, at least, battle with a potential prize. You had to chase down a quarry, you had to corner it, and these mer merchant ships were of course wary of pirates, so they were trying to escape them. And then if it came to battle, which sometimes it did, you needed basically a military leader who could direct what was happening with respect to the military operations of the ship. Obviously, you needed one pirate basically in charge who could make these kinds of decisions unilaterally. Each pirate couldn't independently decide to fire a broadside, for example. That doesn't work. You need one guy in charge to say, we fire now. So for military purposes, you need to have pirates required leaders of some sort. Pirates also required, required a kind of pirate in charge for other basic functions on their ships. So for example, somebody needed to distribute the booty that was seized among the crew members. You needed to put a pirate in charge for that. Somebody also needed to distribute victuals, provisions among pirates. And that may seem like a relatively trivial thing to you, but let me assure you, if you were living for, let's say, eight months at sea, food and drink would become rather important to you. And so you need somebody who's gonna allocate that among the crew members too or a variety of other tasks that pirates required a pirate in charge for. The difficulty that each one of these needs created is that posed by Madison's paradox. If pirates created leaders with the authority to distribute booty, to distribute provisions, and if they created rules, which I'm gonna show you in a moment they did, to enforce those rules, they necessarily created the specter of potential pirate leader abuse. Pirates necessarily, again, couldn't rely on the state in order to overcome that problem. If pirates couldn't do these three things, piracy was not possible. It was that critical. So what were pirate solutions under anarchy? Well, in sum, pirates protected private property rights privately as opposed to through a state. They created and enforced regulations that regulated externalities or behaviors that were likely to generate negative, negative externalities privately. And as I'm going to perhaps most remarkably tell you about in a moment, 
tyrants created and enforced a system of constitutional democracy. This is an actual example of an early 18th century pirate constitution. This comes from the ship, the Royal Fortune, which was captained by Bart Roberts, that highly successful pirate captain I mentioned to you a moment ago. Although I know that you are capable of reading, I am nonetheless going to read the provisions out to you in a manner suggesting that you cannot. One, every man has a vote in the affairs of moment. Two, to defraud any of the company to the value of a dollar, marooning is his punishment. Who knows what marooning is? Sir? Uh, you yeah, as one pirate put it, which I thought very poetically, to make one the governor of his own life. <laughs> Three, no person to gain at cards or dice for money. Back to my casino example, gambling was prohibited on, a pirate, on pirate ships. Four, the lights were to be put out at 8 p.m. and drinking afterward restricted to the deck. Why do you think pirate crews had that rule? What's that? Maybe. I'm thinking of something even more, more straightforward, though. Regulate externalities, exactly. Pirates like to drink. But you couldn't just let drinking go unregulated because pirates also needed to sleep in order to be effective. So if you were a partying sort of pirate, what you had to do if you wanted to continue your late night, in fact, it was actually pretty early night drinking, anything past 8 p.m., you had to do it on the deck so as to allow the other crew members to get sufficient sleep. You had to keep your piece, pistols, and cutlass clean and fit for service. This is another sort of feature of pirate law that is regulating externality generating behavior. It's mandatory that you basically keep your fighting equipment in good order in order to render you permanently ready for battle. No boy or woman to be allowed on the pirate ship. Hmm. What do you think that was for? Negative externalities. <laughs> Women and boys were objects of sexual desire, and they were likely to, at least prospectively, lead to conflicts on pirate ships. So pirates' solution was to simply ban them from their ships. To desert the ship where one's quarters in battle would be punished with death or marooning, similar to provision five. No one was to strike one another on board, and any quarrels between pirates were to be ended on shore by duel. Why do you think that is? Regulated externalities, I think I heard somebody say it again. As I mentioned, if in fact a conflict broke out between two pirates, it could kill other crew members or in fact damage the ship. So pirate solution was, if we in fact cannot peaceably come to a resolution, we're going to have a duel take place on land, away from the ship, such that the ship and its crew members are out of harm's way. This duel was in fact adjudicated by an important pirate leader, who I'm going to come to in a moment, called the Quartermaster. And he would basically take the pirates on shore and lead them a pace back to back a certain distance, and then they would turn and the first to draw blood was considered the victor. That was a form of pirate uh, adjudication. If any man loses a limb or becomes a cripple in the pirate service, he is to have $800 out of the public stock and for lesser hurts proportionately. What does that sound like to you? Workers' comp, right? Social insurance. Pirates weren't unionized. Nevertheless, they managed to come up with an important policy that labor unions often claim credit for, and that is workers' compensation or social insurance. Some pirate constitutions, systems of pirate law, in fact, had very detailed provisions for this. So if you lost your right arm in battle, it would be worth a certain number of dollars. If you lost your left arm, a different amount, presumably because typically the right arm was worth more than the left because most pirates were probably right-handed. If you lost your left eye, you'd get a certain amount, or your right leg, a different amount, and so on. The idea behind this system of social insurance that pirates developed was not a result of the fact that pirates were interested in establishing some kind of a welfare state or were particularly generous. It was a means of incentivizing pirates to basically put forth more effort in battle. Battle was privately costly to pirates, so if you went out there charging, if you were in conflict with the prey, you were likely to get shot or hurt. In order to, ass to assuage or ameliorate part of that cost that you would bear, pirates adopted the system of social insurance. So, after there had been a battle with a prize, before the booty was distributed to crew members in payment, something I'm going to come to in a moment, or perhaps you've already read it on the slide behind me, what pirates did was they took the sum off the top and then distributed these insurance payouts out to, out to injured crew members according to the injuries that they had sustained. 
Provision 10 refers to the terms of piratical employment when it comes to pay. The captain, who was another pirate officer who surely you've all heard of, and the quartermaster, who I referred to a moment ago, were to receive, receive two shares in payment of any prize that was seized. The master, the bosun, the gunner, one and a half shares, any other minor officers, one and a quarter, and the rest of the crew, which was obviously the vast majority of pirates on a ship, each received a single share. Finally, Provision 8, the musicians on the pirate ship who provided piratical entertainment were to have rest on the Sabbath day. Rather puritanical. When you combine the gambling prohibition, the drinking restrictions, and the giving, keeping holy the Sabbath, maybe we're back in your church situation of anarchy that I mentioned before as opposed to what, as opposed to one pirate ship. <clears throat> Pirates devised these things privately, as I mentioned, and they wrote them down. This, these, these were their constitutions. But these constitutions operated and existed within a, a more elaborate system of private piratical governance. A system of democracy suggested by the first article in this pirate constitution and checks and balances, which I'm going to describe for you now. Pirates' solution to the paradox of power that I mentioned to you earlier was twofold. On the one hand, they created these, so first of all, note that these regulations, these laws, create a solution to the problem of protecting property rights and regulating externalities. They also were part of a solution to the paradox of power in the, in the following way. By putting down in writing, by making explicit the various rules that pirate leaders, the captain and the quartermaster, were to follow the pirate ship, pirates made it common knowledge among crew members whether or not the activities that a pirate leader was engaged in were consistent with their law, in other words, that they were socially beneficial for the crew, or rather constituted some kind of piratical self-dealing, some sort of privately beneficial behavior that, in fact, hurt the rest of the crew. In order to bolster that system, pirates added democracy, provision one. On a pirate ship, the captain and the quartermaster, the two chief, uh, the two chief officers, were both dem democratically elected by the crew, it was one pirate, one vote, and they could be and were democratically deposed by pirate crew members for any reason. Most notably, for example, if one of the pirate officers abused his authority or violated one of the rules that provided governance for the pirate crew. I mentioned, I've now mentioned repeatedly, the captain and the quartermaster. This was the third aspect of pirate system of private governance. Pirates divided power. They created a system of checks and balances. On merchant ships, which I've referred to a couple of times, of this era, authority was typically concentrated in the hands of the captain alone. He was sort of like an autocratic ruler on a merchant ship. On a pirate ship, in contrast, it was divided between two primary officers. The quartermaster, who in fact wielded the lion's share of the authority on a pirate ship, he was the one charged with enforcing these rules, refereeing the duel. He was also the one charged with administering booty to crew members, according to the provisions laid out in Article 10 here, and administering provisions to the crew. The captain, in turn, only had power when it came to military operations that I mentioned to you earlier. As a result, pirates, rather than concentrating authority in a single officer's hands, divided it up, checking and balancing one sort of authority against the other. Okay, did this system of pirate private governance work. The system of private private pirate governance that existed in the face of hard case anarchy, recall. Remember who these guys are. Well, I say, here's a hint up here. We remember Caribbean pirates nearly, or in fact, more than two centuries after they left the world. There's a reason we remember them. They were highly successful. And the reason, as I suggested earlier, the only reason they could be highly successful was because they had succeeded in privately governing their ships in the first place in the face of deviations from easy case anarchy. Remarkably, as you can read here, pirates developed a system of governance that mirrored the American system, system of government that is so famous and we are, of course, familiar with today. But pirates, incredibly, did so more than half a century before America's founding fathers, those guys who wrote the Federalist Papers that I know you're all going to go read now. In fact, had even put pen to paper. They anticipated it. And, equally incredible from my perspective and important for this talk, pirates created this system without the government part. It looks and operates in many ways just like the American system of government, but there's a crucial difference. 
pirate system of governance was entirely voluntary. It was based on consent. In that sense, it was like your church. It was like being a member of an Amish community. It was like being a member of a book club or coming to this discussion today. These were voluntary communities, not communities that were compelled together, not communities in which tribute was demanded by authorities, captains or, or quartermasters, which of course the analog to which would be government in our society. Okay. Let's move on to Somalia. The next thing I want to talk to you about is the hardest case anarchy piece of what I mentioned earlier. So pirates are, are this case of anarchy, hopefully you'll agree, working better than you think despite deviations from easy case conditions. In fact, in the presence of very hard case conditions. But they don't address the issue of whether or not such a system of governance, an anarchic setup, could in fact do better than a government. For that purpose, I want to turn to, I want to, turn to Somalia. First, it's important to note that Somalia also constitutes hard case anarchy in the sense that it deviates from the conditions of easy case anarchy that I live in. Somalia is not small, so maybe you could say, look, pirates were bad apples, and they were heterogeneous, and they couldn't rely on government, but at the end of the day, their crews were very small. You know, Relative to merchant ships, they were big, but 100 guys isn't so many. Maybe it's not so difficult to achieve social cooperation under those conditions. Well, Somalia has 10 and a half million inhabitants. I think we can all agree that that's a relatively large population. Obviously, Somalia, in, as in any population of 10 and a half million people, is not homogenous. There are a large number of ways in which Somali citizens differ from each other, a whole bunch of dimensions, as you would expect in any population of that size. Also, after 1991, in Somalia, it was not possible to rely on the state. In this sense, although for different reasons, pirates are different from Somalia. I'm sorry, are diff uh, yeah, pirates are different from Somalia. Anybody know why after 1991 in Somalia it wasn't possible for citizens to rely on the state? The government collapsed. You were going to say it. Fallen dictatorship. Somalia was ruled up until 1991 by a brutal dictator named Siad Mare who has one of the worst human rights uh, track records in, in modern history. And in 1991, there was a coup that led to his deposition. And most of you are too young to remember this, but for those, who, those of you who are old enough and were reading newspapers, you probably remember the tremendous amount of hand-wringing that existed in the press over the situation of anarchy that had broken out in Somalia as a consequence of the collapse of its government. Now, when we could talk about this aspect a little bit later, whether or not one wants to consider Somalia today as existing under a government or under a situation of anarchy is something we can talk about. But for the purposes of what I'm going to focus on here, I want you to think about Somalia between circa 1991 and circa 2005. During that period, everyone agrees, to my knowledge anyway, that Somalia existed under a situation of utter statelessness. So, I talked to you before about heretical problems. What type of problems does Somalia confront in the absence of government? All of you. There is no problem that they do not confront as a result of the absence of government. So pirate ships had rather particular problems that they faced because they were engaged in a unified activity. Right? They were engaged in piracy. But because they were engaged in a unified activity, that restricted, in some, to some extent, the scope of the problems that they engaged in. Pirates, for example, didn't need to devise some sort of currency in order to engage in exchange with each other. That didn't, that didn't need to, what well, wasn't the case for them. There was money that, already, that they could already rely on. In Somalia, that wasn't true. Central bank went away with the collapse of government. All institutions of state-provided law and order went away. Anything that you think about that a government currently does went away in Somalia after 1991. So any sort of problem that you think might lead to chaos and disorder in stateless Somalia consequently existed, or exists again, depending upon your perspective about the status of Somalia today. I don't want to spend a lot of time, as I did uh, on pirate solution to their problems, um, on talking about stateless Somalia citizens' solutions to their problems. They're very interesting, but I want to, I'm going to spend more time on something else. So 
I will, I will mention this only briefly. Thinking, first of all, in terms of basic law and order, where did it come from in Somalia? You might think it didn't come from anywhere. And again, if you read popular press reports, you probably would think exactly that. The warlords are running rampant over the country. Everyone is dying. There's civil war. In fact, there was civil war. It was terrible for a few years. After that, however, things died down considerably. In fact, by the time that we get into the early 2000s, the homicide rate in Somalia was something like perhaps the homicide rate in Mexico around a similar period. So how is it that, that Somalis solve these problems? Customary law. You ever ask yourself, where does law come from? Obviously, in the United States, we've got legislation. We've got governments that create law. Do you think that there would be no rules that existed if, in fact, government didn't create laws? Clearly not, right? All of those examples that I began with, your book club, this room, your church, the Amish, and so on, part of the reason that you probably already know intuitively, at least, for why those situations, despite the absence of a state, in some sense, do not lead to utter collapse, chaos, and disorder, is because in the absence of state-created rules and enforcement of those rules, all of those organizations create their own private rules and enforce them. So your church, for example, has rules, and they are enforced by the church membership. Your book club has rules. Texas Tech University has rules. The Free Market Institute has rules, and this room has rules. Customs that we're all following. A lot of times those rules, in fact, perhaps most of the time, are more important than the formally created pieces of legislation or statutes that governments create. They have a bigger impact on our daily lives, and they regulate our behavior to a greater extent. Think about your everyday interactions with people. For the most part, they're governed by a variety of non-articulated rules about social interaction. Some of you might be thinking right now, this Leeson guy is an incredible jackass. I can't believe I'm listening to him. In fact, the gentleman is leaving, perhaps showing me that right now. <laughs> and yet, none of you are shouting that at me. I haven't seen anybody flip me the bird yet, although, again, there's always the possible exception of Ben later on in the talk. Oh, there we go. We got a gentleman in the back. Of me. Those, somebody who held the door for me, a kind fellow, I don't see him now, in the back there, held the door for me when I walked in. That's a social rule. I met some new people today. I didn't spit in their eye or kick them in the knee and try and take their wallet. Why? Not only because I'm small and they could pummel me, and not only because there is a city police department in Lubbock, which probably wouldn't have gotten there fast enough anyway, but because of the fact that there are social norms. There are these, these customs that we follow that regulate our behavior. Well, in societies historically, before the introduction of states and before the introduction of legislation and statutes, Social rules were even more so rooted in custom, perhaps, than they are today. All sorts of social interactions were based on that. And in Somalia in particular, there is a history of customary law, which is separate from its religious law. Who's heard of Sharia law? A few people. That's one source of private rules and regulations, which has a religious basis, an Islamic basis in Somalia. But there is one that precedes that, which is called here, a word that's spelled with an X up on my slide. That is a system of customary law that regulates primarily, although not exclusively, inter-clan relationships, interpersonal relationships in Somalia. Again, I'm not going to go into detail about this, but I, I want to point to one aspect of it, which is this thing called dia, which I have up here. Anybody ever heard of that before? What's it mean? Blood price. That's what it means. In Somalia, under their customary legal system, if, for example, you murder somebody in Ben's clan, your entire clan has to pay a price to Ben's clan in order to make compensation for it. We don't lock up the guy who committed the murder. We don't execute him. We, in fact, make an economic transfer in order to make things right. Note that I said that the entire clan has to make a payment. There's a collective aspect. It's not just the guy who committed the crime. It's all of his clan. Why might that be a sensible part of any sort of legal system, although it's not typically part of our legal system? Anybody have an idea? Yes? Yeah, 
It affects incentives, right? Now everybody, if, I, if we're in the same clan, what's your name, sir? Eric? Is that what you said? Yeah. If Eric and I are in the same clan, and I think, you know, Eric's a little bit shady, which I do think. <laughs> I'm, and we have this system under customary law for in Somalia, I'm going to really want to make sure, keep a very close eye on Eric to make sure that he doesn't end up hurting Ben or somebody in Ben's clan, because ultimately that's going to come out of my pocket. It creates very strong incentives. When I was in graduate school, I had a, a professor in my micro class, and this is when cell phones were kind of just becoming the rage. I know it's hard for probably most of you to imagine, but in any event, students were bringing cell phones to class, and he hated it when cell phones went off in class. So he created the following rule. If anybody's cell phone goes off in class, the person sitting next to them gets an F. Think about that for a minute. Right? Not the person whose phone went off, the person sitting next to them. That's kind of like leveraging the logic of this diet thing that I've been talking about, this part of here, Somali customary law, incentivizing the behavior of other members, people around you, in order to monitor and enforce aspects of rules that improve social cooperation, or the non-going off of cellular phones, maybe in my micro class. I mentioned money before. Where does Somali money come from? Well, Somali money came from, after the collapse of government, the previous money, which was called the Somali shilling. So obviously when the central bank collapsed, there was no longer the production of, at least by the government, of new pieces of currency. So Somalis continued to trade using the old paper notes. As you might expect, when no new notes are being produced, over time, since they're paper, these things deteriorate. So slowly, the stock of money got smaller and smaller. One sort of view would say, well, that's just anarchy for you. The money supply is going to shrivel up, all the notes are going to go away, look, the people can't trade. There's another way of thinking about it, though, if you think about it like an economist. What would you do, or think about it like an entrepreneur? If the, su if the supply of Somali shillings, for example, gets shriveled up because they're being deteriorated in circulation, what does that do to the value of the Somali shilling? Here's a hint. It doesn't go down. <laughs> And therefore, what might you do as an enterprising type? Well, if you have the resources anyway, you might do what some warlords in Somalia did, which was in fact finance the production of new Somali shilling, and shilling notes, which they did abroad and then import them into the country, because you get to profit on that seniorage. Some people call that counterfeiting. When there's no state, though, it's not counterfeiting. And in fact, it probably inured to the benefit of the Somali population, because it improved the dwindling supply of Somali notes. Okay. The part that I really want to talk to you about with respect to Somalia. I said I was going to talk to you about Somalia in the context of hardest case anarchy. The question about whether or not it's possible for an utterly stateless society to in fact outperform one with government. Does such a unicorn exist? And the answer is, the answer is yes, and it probably isn't a unicorn, which is to say it probably isn't that rare. Here's one way of thinking about that question. So, here are 18 development indicators. These are pretty conventional development indicators. They're uh, welfare indicators for which data are available that development economists and others commonly look at. The sources of the data aren't up here. You can, I've written a paper and you can look. They're all conventional sources of data. In the first column, what I have is for the most part, the, uh, the figure is corresponding to the welfare indicator for the United States in approximately 2005. And what is in the right column are the same welfare outcomes for Somalia between the period of 2000 and 2005, the period of undisputed anarchy in Somalia. What do we see? Well, GDP per capita in the United States in constant dollars is a little over 44,000. Somalia is 600. Life expectancy in the United States is approaching 80 years. In Somalia is just a shade under 50. Combined school enrollment in the United States is approximating 100%. In Somalia, it doesn't manage to even hit 8%. And so on for every indicator that's up there. The ones with the dashes, by the way, are those where I simply was unable to quickly collect the data. If I had spent a little bit more time, I could have found them. And I can promise you, they would have followed the exact same pattern here. So if you were to perform this comparison, the United States of America, which is obviously under a central government, versus Somalia at the same period of time, which is under anarchy. 
what would you conclude about with respect to the question that I posed a moment ago, which is, can anarchy outperform the United States? Can anarchy outperform government? I think it's an unambiguous no, right? Looks like anarchy's getting its tail kicked pretty hardy right here. What's wrong with this comparison? So I want to tell you a very quick little story. Um, you may have noticed I'm fond of telling. So when, uh, also when I was in graduate school, I uh, was going to buy what was for me buy my buy my my first car. I was looking to buy a car. I had like about 200 bucks. Um, I didn't graduate that long ago, so it really is a really low amount. <laughs> okay. So you know, it turns out that in my sort of opportunity set with 200 dollars, you can get a 1981 Honda Civic with like 150,000 miles on it. One of the wheels is kind of like at a 45 degree angle to the ground. Um, didn't have power steering, obviously. Basically, the doors didn't function, so you had to like somehow figure out how to get in through the trunk. Something along those lines. That was that was what I was looking at. Or you could get yourself a shiny new Schwinn bicycle. Um, those were those were pretty much pretty much my options. So. I lived relatively far from campus, so I ended up deciding on this, this Honda Civic, which I bought, and it actually, it, it was a stick. I didn't know how to drive a stick, so there was some damage done there. Um, but really, with a car like that, can you do a lot of damage to it? Probably not, right? It's already pretty close to, pretty close to as damaged as we get. In any event, I was absolutely thrilled with this purchase. I was so excited about the huge improvement in my life I was going to have now because I had a car to get to campus. I was gonna save all this time, it was really cool. So naturally then, you can imagine my incredible disappointment when I came to campus and I ran into one of my friends, an extraordinarily wealthy friend of mine. Okay, he was actually not in the same program that I was, but we were, we were pretty close. And I pulled up, and by pull up again, the thing like kind of puttered at like a weird angle of the parking spot. Uh, and I got out and I was like, ta-da, check it out. And he said, you bought, you bought a Honda. Honda Civic. And I said, yeah, I bought, I bought a Honda Civic. And he said, you made a huge mistake. What do you mean I made a huge mistake? I, you know, I was super excited. He said, you, you should have bought a Bentley. Everybody know what a Bentley is? It's like a fancy Rolls Royce, okay? Think about that. So I said, I should have bought a Bentley. And he said, yeah, have you ever seen, seen a Bentley? I said, I've seen a Bentley. The hood ornament, you push a button, the hood ornament will actually retract in the hood. It's all walnut wood interior, and there's a spot where you can put your cigars. You know, there's an actual humidor built into the car, and it's all leather, and you know, this is like whatever some celebrity at the time drove. So, yeah, you know, I'm familiar with the Bentley. The thing is, the Bentley costs like 175 grand. Um, from his perspective, the Honda was a horrible purchase that, in fact, had made me worse off. Okay, so that's that's my little tale. Hopefully you're getting a sense now of, of where I'm about to go with this. The, I want to unpack a little bit the intuition that I hope you got from my little story about the Honda, the Bentley, and the Schwinn. Uh, I want to formalize it a little bit. So why is it, hopefully you agree, that my friend was wrong in concluding that for my purchase of the Honda, I had been made, made worse off because I did not buy a Bentley. Right, hopefully you agree with that. So why exactly is that? Well, I think there's two basic elements to why that is, if you think about it, oh, again, just a little bit more formal. The first of these is what I call the fallacy of unconstrained choice, okay? So what I want you to think about are governments of various quality. So not all governments are the same quality, right? You can, some governments are really high quality. Like the government of the United States is extremely high quality. Our, our rulers, you may have your beefs, but our, our rulers, for the most part, seem to have overcome Madison's paradox of power that I mentioned before. They're basically, for the most part, not stealing your stuff. They're not expropriating you. They're not, you know, breaking your door down. Well, sometimes they do that, of course, and, and raiding your house and so on. And then you can think of governments in other places that perhaps don't function so well. So anybody know anything about the Democratic Republic of Congo? Yeah. What would you guess based on that? How do you think their government looks? Not like in the United States, okay? Not like it at all. It's an extremely low quality government. Corruption is rampant. The state uses its power not primarily to protect citizens and promote general welfare, 
but instead to systematically prey on parts of the population at political ruler's expense. Surely you've all heard of the rampant corruption that in general plagues countries such as the Democratic Republic of Congo in Sub-Saharan Africa. Those are very low quality governments. And those qualities of government sort of all in between. So I think about the US style government for illustrative purposes is what we'll call it first best government or a first best state. And then we can go down the line all the way to the, the nth best, which is like the worst quality government or state. You can do the same thing for anarchies, right? Systems of self-governance that do or do not emerge when the state isn't there. If tomorrow in Texas, imagine that, imagine that Texas seceded from the Union and that the state government and all municipal governments disappeared. Do you think that Texas would descend into utter chaos and disorder? Probably not. I don't think so. Maybe, maybe you think some things wouldn't work as well. That's totally reasonable. There might be some looting, some rioting, although I think probably not, but it's possible. Some things might get worse, but in general, it might not be horrible. Now suppose that we took away government in a society or a community with a very different history, say in the Democratic Republic of Congo again. I don't know how nobody raised their hand when I asked if you knew what the Democratic Republic, Republic of Congo was, but I can assure you, as a result of a history of civil war, genocide, rampant corruption, absence of trust, and so on that pervades society, anarchy probably wouldn't look very good there. Does that make sense to everybody? So just like there is first best through nth best, we can rank the sort of qualities of governments, we can do the same thing with self-governance or with anarchies. The fallacy of unconstrained choice basically involves pretending that we have, if we're choosing between what sort of society we're going to have, one governed by a government or one governed not by a government, an anarchy, a self-governing arrangement. It involves pretending that we have at our disposal any quality of any sort of system that we want, when in fact we are restricted, we only have, because of historical constraints for example, we only have relatively low quality options available to us. Does that make sense to everyone? It's very similar to my, unsurprisingly, my Honda, Schwinn, and Bentley example. It's like pretending that I could actually choose the Bentley when the Bentley wasn't available because I only had $200, not 175000 right? So that's the fallacy of unconstrained choice. The fallacy of unconstrained choice typically leads directly to the second fallacy that's involved in the, in the, Bentley, in the Honda, Bentley, Schwinn case that I gave you before which I call a fallacy of irrelevant comparisons. So we have our ordering again of government quality and anarchy quality, and we've just acknowledged that, okay, we're going to be, we're not in an unconstrained world typically, we're going to have some constraints about the quality that we have. Typically, I want to suggest that the various constraints, cultural, historical, and so on, that I kind of briefly touched on a moment ago, tend to restrict us to Governance qualities, regardless of the type we choose, whether it's government or self-governance under anarchy, of roughly approximately equivalent quality level. In other words, in the same places where government works extremely well, like the United States or in Texas, if we got rid of government, anarchy would also work pretty well. Doesn't mean that anarchy would work better than government there, just that among the types of anarchies that might exist, it worked pretty well. And in the Democratic Republic of Congo, government, doesn't work very well, and if they had anarchy, anarchy probably wouldn't work very well either. If that's right, and I think we have very strong reasons to think that it is, in general we're going to be restricted to qualities of governance of the same level across anarchy versus state, or across self-governance versus government. And if that's right, it doesn't make sense to compare first best welfare outcomes under first best governments say the United States, to the welfare outcomes under nth best, the really poor anarchies. For example, anarchy in Somalia. Does that make sense to everyone? It makes sense to compare if we had a, an anarchic, if we had a society that had similar social and historical constraints or set up to the United States but no government, we could observe anarchy there and compare that to government of the United States. But comparing government in the United States to anarchy in Somalia doesn't make any sense unless you actually think 
that if we were to introduce a government in Somalia, that it would look like the government of the United States. Does anybody think that that's true? Probably not, right? That'd be a really optimistic reading of things. Things wouldn't tend to work very well. So what we need to do is to compare across equal qualities. When you commit these dual fallacies, you're living in, this, is, this image is an illustration of what's going on in your head, or effectively what's going on in your head, right? You're engaging in magical unicorn thinking with a rainbow coming out of your rear. Uh, because you're living in a world without constraints, right? You're pretending like it's possible to have something available that isn't possible. You're pretending like you could have bought the Bentley when in fact you could only have afforded either the Schwinn or the Honda. So the relevant consideration is which is better, the Schwinn or the Honda, not which is better, the Honda or the Bentley. Performing that comparison suggests that we should consider not how welfare under government in the United States compares to, to anarchy in Somalia, but how government in Somalia compared to anarchy in Somalia. Because we know that the government that Somalia had is actually one of the alternatives that was available to Somalia. They, in fact, had it. So we want to know, did government in Somalia outperform anarchy in Somalia? That's the relevant comparison. And that is what I have performed for you here. And as you can see, on virtually every welfare indicator for which data are available, the answer is that anarchy outperformed government. And not just a little, but a lot. You see this? Life expectancy under anarchy in Somalia went up relative to under government. Immunizations went up relative to under government. The number of doctors available went up relative to under government. Infant mortality went down relative to under government. Maternal mortality went down relative to under government. The population with access to water went up under anarchy. Population with access to sanitation went up with, under anarchy. And so on and so on. Clearly, anarchy in Somalia outperformed government in Somalia, which is the relevant alternative for Somalia, not United States government. So here we have a real-world empirical example of a society under hard-case anarchy existing without any government outperforming the relevant government that's available. Does this mean that Somalia, for example, would not, at least in principle, be better off, for instance, if it could have a United States-style government, if we could actually have that. I think that the previous chart that I showed you suggests that clearly it would be better, but that doesn't matter. That's like saying, if I had unlimited income, should I buy the Bentley? Yup. Guess what? I don't have unlimited income. And similarly, Somalia doesn't have US-style government, in fact, available as a government's alternative. Okay, I want to very quickly, I'm going to skip over some, a little bit of stuff here to get to some sort of policy punchline. Why should you care about this is what I want to talk about. Remember back to Madison's paradox, right, where he said, we need to create rulers in order for, if he meant government rulers, politicians, we need to create a government in order to make sure that we're respecting property rights, that we don't have rampant theft and violence and so on. But the danger, and the unavoidable danger, is that the people that we empower for that purpose could turn that power against us. Right? Hence the checks and balances that he described in the Federal Reserve that become the system of government that we enjoy today. Well, what about a different way of solving Madison's paradox in our own society, in our own country, for example? Maybe we can avoid at least part of the paradox if we're able to avoid creating, if we can reduce the number of roles that we have to create for government in the first place. The fewer powers that we have to give to the government, the fewer dangers there are that those powers can be turned against us. If, as I have suggested, anarchy in fact works considerably better, hopefully, than you think, then the scope, even in our society, for relying on self-governance versus for government grows larger, which in turn means that we can avert more and more of Madison's paradox of power simply by never having to confront it in the first place because we're not endowing authorities with additional, uh, endowing government authorities with additional power. <laughs>
Perhaps even more important if you're interested in, in welfare, welfare for the world, is the developing world. In the developing world, it's important to understand that a very large, perhaps the majority, at least in, in the least developed world, of governments are like the type, the nth best that I described to you before, like in the Democratic Republic of Congo, or like the government that existed in Somalia before it collapsed. Remember, I noted that Barre had one of the worst human right, uh, records of human rights abuses, property violations, and so on. That's what most of the governments look like in the least developed world. Many of these governments are hanging on, they only exist by a thread that's provided by the international community. Resources that are sent in to prop up those governments to make sure that those societies don't collapse into anarchy like happened in Somalia in 1991. Well, the reasoning and the evidence that I just suggested and provided for you imply that that may be the exact opposite of the thing that we should want or should be doing. If, in fact, anarchy outperforms government, at least when we're comparing nth best government and nth best anarchy, as it is in Somalia, perhaps the least developed countries of the world, similar to Somalia, would also be better off under anarchy, with all of its warts, given that we're dealing in an nth best world, than they would be under a predatory government, which is the relevant government that's available today. With that, I will stop, and if we have time, open it up for questions.